So if we can learn anything from those people, it is be the best version of you you can be and let everyone else make the acclaims for you. What's up, everybody? It's episode 70 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Aaron Wayne Duke. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but on Martial Arts Radio, I'm your host. Whistlekick, as many of you know, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you tuning in again. If you're not familiar with our products, why don't you head on over to whistlekick.com and take a look at what we make. We have a number of different t-shirts from the technical to the comfortable for before, during, and after your training and every other occasion you might think of. Now, if you want to see the show notes, those are on a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Just like with our last couple of episodes, this one features a quiz. So after you've listened, head to the website, go to the show notes page, take that quiz, and see how you stack up with others on the leaderboard. Today we're joined by Mr. Aaron Wayne Duke. Mr. Duke is a practitioner of Taekwondo, Hapkido, an author, and really a passionate fan of most aspects of martial arts education and culture. We had a great conversation that wandered all over the map, just the way I like them to go. Rather than try to give you an index for how our chat went, I'd rather just let you listen. Mr. Duke, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure, and I appreciate the time. Absolutely. I appreciate your time. It's going to be a lot of fun. Listeners will notice there's there's a difference in your audio quality versus a lot of the guests that we've had. You've got some professional audio and musical work in your background, and we'll probably touch on that, but you've got a great microphone. Your microphone's better than mine, and I bet we're going to hear that in posts that you probably sound a little better than me. Well, I, but that's I okay. promise it wasn't on purpose that I was trying to show you <laughs> up. It's, uh, as I said, my background uh, lends a little bit of credibility to having some of this equipment. So, And I'll be more than happy to share that information with your listeners if you know they're looking to improve the quality of the, maybe their prod, uh, podcasts, uh, recordings, or things like that. It, it is important. It is. It is. And you know what? You should be showing me up because this show isn't about me. It's about the guests. And this episode is about you. So by all means, I mean, maybe I should, maybe I should downgrade my microphone. So all the guests sound better. Who knows? <laughs> you do what makes you happy, Jeremy. Hey, whatever the listeners want, that's what makes me happy. But of course, we're not on here to talk about audio gear and podcasts and things of that nature, at least not principally. We're here to talk about martial arts and you as a martial artist have an origin story. So why don't you take a minute? Take us back a little ways and tell us how you got started in the martial arts. A great story. Hopefully, I'll be able to keep it very short. Like many children, I was inspired by things that I saw, things that I read. Um, Kung Fu Theater was something that I you know, embraced early on. Um, any type of action movies, you know, the James Bond movies and things like that, you know, even as a child, uh, you know, I grew up primarily in the 70s, so things like uh, Wonder Woman, The Incredible Hulk, uh, those things were on the air. So you were seeing some action compared to what is being put out today. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty tame. But it was a, a great influence uh, seeing those types of things. I, I, I've loved comic books and comic book heroes uh, for a long, long time. But uh, fast forward, I had the downtown paper route in Galesburg, Illinois, which you know I, I live and have grown up here, uh, here in the Midwest. And there was a small school that was right across the street from our public library. And it was one of the final stops that I delivered papers to on a, on a Monday through Saturday basis. And I would walk by and just be so drawn and fascinated. Um, but, you know, mom wouldn't let me. You know, it was, can I do martial arts? No, you'll become a bully. Uh, can I do martial arts? No, we can't afford it. And I had a paper route. Um, but you know, it, it's, you have to have your parents permission, obviously when you're 12 or 13 years old. Um, but fast forward to that one day it's the middle of winter and, um, you know, it's cold. The windows are all fogged up cause they're in there kicking and punching and, and doing all that fun stuff. 
and I stuck my nose on their window, you know, completely disrespectful, uh, but didn't mean to be, you know, it was just, I couldn't see what was going on and I had so much interest. And so I stuck my, <laughs> my face, um, on the window and it didn't take more than probably a few seconds. Uh, the door kicks open and there is standing, um, the late great Bob Zeffo. And I say that because Bob was a uh, black belt in the Kuxulwan organization, uh, very well known around this area and very well known in that organization and in that martial art. But Bob was the very first martial art black belt that I ever met. And he knew I was the paper boy and he basically is like, you know, Hey, you want to come in and, you know, watch some, you know, watch us do some stuff. And I came in and, you know, he talked to me for a few minutes. Of course I went home that night and I was all excited because I, you know, a black belt talked to me and I thought he was going to kill me because, you know, I put my nose print on his window. Asked mom, can I take lessons? No, you can't. So more time goes by. One day my uncle shows up at my mom's house and says, Hey, I'm working at this restaurant and this guy that they just hired as a cook uh, is throwing kicks on his break and he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And he says he teaches martial arts. Do you want to meet him? I said, yeah. So I literally get in the car. We drive out to the mall here, takes me inside the restaurant. And I said, are you Kevin? And the guy, you know, yeah, yeah. I said, uh, you teach martial arts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, uh, how much do you charge? Uh, $25 a month. I said, great. What's your address? You know? So he takes a, um, an order pad from one of the waitresses writes down his address, his phone number, gives it to me. I go home. I tell my mom and she says, fine. Cause I think she just was tired of hearing me say it, and, you know, like, okay, fine, whatever. So I got on my bicycle and I drove probably eight or 10 blocks away to this gentleman's home, uh, who just was teaching his garage and, uh, walked in, had my first lesson with, uh, Kevin Clevenger, who is still a great friend and mentor to me. And, um, that's really how it started. It was just, kind of a fluke. He had just come back from the army. Uh, he had moved back to Galesburg. My uncle met him and uh, the rest is history. Uh, the organized school in town, uh, I, I didn't join. I ended up joining this class in this guy's garage and I stayed with him uh, until he stopped teaching um, and I moved away to college. And then we've reconnected and, and stayed very close for many, many, many years. But like so many people's story, it is not extravagant. Uh, didn't train in a huge, gigantic dojo or uh, school. It was just a garage with some carpet and there was no heat in the winter and there was no AC in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> very bare bones, very minimalist. And I know that we've got some. You had to want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's something kind of special about that because of the people that you end up training with. When you go to a, a maybe a, a a fuzzier, a warmer, cooler, depending on the time of year, martial arts school makes it a little bit more approachable, which is great, especially from a business side. Yeah. But I think we've all had time training with people that maybe didn't quite want to be there, that if it was five degrees warmer, cooler, you know, on one side or the other, depending on the time of year, they may not have been there. Well, one of the things that I always find interesting for me is when I – left, you know, I moved away from Galesburg and I remember the first time I walked into a studio and they had mats and I didn't know what it was. And, and I don't mean that to be ignorant, but you know, this is really before the internet, which is showing my age. Um, but I really, I hadn't seen that before. I didn't know that that was a possibility. You know, I didn't realize that people, you know, didn't just train on concrete, <laughs> you know, and the <laughs> right. first time I stepped on the mats, uh, the the real honest thing that happened was it threw my whole game off. You know, just throwing kicks was completely different because the surface was different than what I was used to. I was used to just, you know, one thin little piece of carpet over some concrete. And, you know, I used to do things like grip with my toes and things like that when I'd throw kicks um, because you kind of had to. Because once that carpet got wet and it's just concrete underneath, you know, and then you're on your, you're on your tailbone. Um, and then I was like, wait a minute. This is like spongy and soft. You, what you guys take break falls on this stuff? This stuff is like falling on a bed. And I just kind of laugh at the um, the simplicity of my understanding of the rest of the world of martial arts because that garage, to me, still it's it's almost like a, a sacred place, a holy place because so many memories and so many things happen. But I didn't need a matted floor. I didn't need air conditioning. I didn't need a dressing room or a shower. You know what I mean? I just needed a place to go and learn. So. 
That's great. And I can imagine myself there with you, of course. You know, I, I've trained on a whole bunch of surfaces, concrete, hardwood, pavement, gravel. Um, fortunately, not too much gravel. But yeah, I had a similar response the first time that I trained on mats too. And honestly, I still don't prefer to train on mats. But that's a whole different story. We're not here to tell my stories. We're here to hear yours. And now it's time for us to really start digging into some of the things that you've experienced through your time in the martial arts. And so we're going to kick that off by hearing your best martial arts story. The best martial arts story, that is such a challenge. Um, the one that comes to mind almost immediately when people ask me, you know, tell me a story about a training experience, whatever. Uh, it, late 1990, I was in the Quad Cities. A lot of people but we'll know Davenport, Moline, Rock Island, you know, that area. It's just a bunch of cities kind of collectively there in Iowa and Illinois, just off the Mississippi River. And I went to a uh, seminar with Ben Urquides and um, Nick Tarpin, uh, Tarpin Sensei, who is very well known up in that area and around our area, um, was the host of that seminar. And I was just getting ready to move to Anderson, Indiana to attend uh, a small school there called Anderson University. And um, so I had attended the seminar. I got a chance to train with uh, Urquida Sensei, which was a, a lifelong dream. Um, you know, just a, such a huge fan of his presence and his energy and just his knowledge. And, and I just love Urquida Sensei. Um, and you can't be in a room with him and not be motivated. <laughs> but I was at the seminar and we got to talking afterwards, uh, Urquida Sensei and I and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tarpin. And they were asking me, you know, hey, you had mentioned that you were going to be moving away. Where are you going to be moving? And I said, well, I'm moving to this town, little town in Indiana uh, called Anderson, Indiana. And they both just kind of stopped and looked at me. And I got, you know, almost that uncomfortable feeling like, did I say something wrong? And they said, you're moving to what many people refer to as the Mecca of martial arts. And I just kind of looked at them and I was like, well, huh? What do you mean? And they said... You're going to the you're going to the the homeland, you know the the land of Bill Superfoot Wallace and Parker Shelton, and you know you're you're going there, um, Glenn Keeney and Ross Scott, and they just continued to throw these names out, and I knew them all, you know, because I I read all the magazines, I bought every magazine that uh, the grocery store would carry that covered martial arts, but I guess I just hadn't put two and two together that all these guys were from Indiana or had spent a lot of time there in Indiana. So I find myself moving to uh, Anderson to attend school and I'm buzzing around. Uh, I had a small apartment in Muncie with a few other guys that were college students and I'm flipping through the yellow pages there in Muncie and I'm like, okay, yeah, that looks all right. And I flip to this uh, advertisement and it's uh, Ron White's USA Karate. And it says on the uh, ad, it says former USKA world champion. I thought that sounds awesome. Uh, I'm going to go meet this guy. So I called him up. And uh, met uh, Mr. White and uh, signed up immediately. And first night, I get there. I think they were kind of testing the waters with me. Uh, and they're like, hey, you know, you got sparring gear? Yeah, I got sparring gear. All right, make sure you bring your sparring gear. You got a mouthpiece? Yeah, I got a mouthpiece. All right, make sure you got your mouthpiece. You got headgear? Yeah, I got headgear. Make sure you got your headgear. And the more they kind of were inferring that I should have protection, the less confident I was getting about my decision because... <laughs> <laughs> I was starting to get the impression that maybe I had a, a challenge coming up that I didn't necessarily want to partake in, if you know what I mean. I felt like I uh, was going to be hazed, but not, I don't want to say that it was a disrespectful type of haze. I felt like they really were like, we well, need to see what this kid's about. And uh, so we get in and we start sparring. And there were some great guys at that that uh, school at that time. Andre Eccleston, who uh, was a, a PKC uh, kickboxing state champion and, and went on to, I think, a regional title and lost at nationals. But many people know uh, Ron White through the USKA. Uh, they called him Whirlwind back in the day, him and Johnny Liebarger and so many great guys uh, from the USKA. Um, just a great guy and he was a great mentor. But long story short, my first sparring session, I stand in front of a gentleman by the name of William Vicchioli. They called him Mr. V. And he's he wasn't a tall man, um, just you know, kind of a gruff. Um, uh, everybody knows a guy like this. Let's put it this way. He um, wasn't tall in stature, but he had a heart uh, and a spirit the size of a mountain, if you can picture that. So we're sparring, and, and uh, you know, I'm 
throwing roundhouse kicks because, you know, I was, a, I was a Taekwondo guy, you know, so I can throw those high kicks. And it wasn't a challenge to kick him in the head. And I think I'd kicked him four or five times in the head and, and you know, we'd kind of break up a little bit and then square off again. And he was smiling. And I just thought, you know, yeah, this is, this is not going to be a problem at all. You know, I'm, I'm going to show these guys that I belong in this black belt class. And about the, the sixth roundhouse kick, I throw one and he throws a straight front kick to my groin. And when he does, I drop, of course, like a sack of potatoes and just, you know, on my knees in front of this man. And uh, he puts his hand on my shoulder and with the straightest of faces says, welcome to Indiana, son. And it was such a surreal moment in time, but it was so necessary. And I know that sounds crazy if you're listening. I needed that in the biggest way because it not only humbled me, but it actually gave me an immediate revelation of where I was going wrong with my training and my mindset. So William Vicchioli uh, is the guy that I always tell everybody that was my welcome to Indiana, a front kick to the groin. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't know that I've been to Indiana, but now I don't know that I want to go. <laughs> it's a great town. If, if, if that is the greeting, the, for me, it, for me, it was, and maybe, maybe they saw something that that I didn't. But that's how I got. That's how I got welcomed into Ron White's USA Karate in Muncie, Indiana, nineteen ninety one. It's a great story, and thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Now, of course, martial arts has threaded through your life for for quite a while now, and you've had quite a few experiences. We just heard about a few of them. We're going to hear about quite a few more, but I'd like to roll back a little bit. You know, back when. You were delivering papers when you were begging your mom to join a martial arts school, and she was telling you no. And let's pretend that individual at the restaurant wasn't there or, or somebody didn't tell you about him or whatever it was. Something happened. You never made that connection. You never started training. Mm. Wow. What do you think life would look like today? Boring. That would be the first thing that pops up. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, uh, that, to me, that's like trying to imagine, you know, my body without my arms or, or uh, oh goodness, what would my life look like? I, you know, honestly, I think I would probably still be involved in something creative because I think the martial arts are definitely a creative outlet uh, for me anyway. Um, uh, wow. I, I would, I would probably bet that I would probably have, have concentrated more on music and uh, performance. I think that's probably where I would have went. The, the two loves of my life as far as passions, things I really enjoy, uh, have always been martial arts and music. So I would venture to say if I couldn't or didn't do martial arts, I would probably be more heavily involved uh, with music. Nothing wrong with that. And of course, Listeners know that is a question that most of our guests struggle with. And as we get deeper into this show, I'm coming to a belief that there are people that truly are destined to enter the martial arts. And most of our guests have been those people that they can't imagine what life even could be without it. Well, you know, I've heard it, uh, Jeremy, many times, and maybe you've heard it too. I've heard it a lot over the years. Uh, instructors or just people I've been, you know, trained with seminars or just visited a school or worked out with some guy at the YMCA who was just visiting, you know, in town, you know, the, I feel like martial arts chose me that I didn't choose martial arts. It's almost like, uh, a, a hard to explain, you know, a, so this weird cosmic thing where, um, it just chose me. Um, I, I don't, I don't really know how to explain that, uh, because I don't know that I was really looking for it, but it found me. And I'm so happy and grateful for that uh, because it, it really did change my life in so many ways. And it, and it has for so many other people as well. I know we all have uh, triumphs and tragedies uh, through the years. We all have uh, moments where our hands are raised and we have moments where, you know, we go home with nothing. Uh, there's moments where, you know, we have sprains and, and broken bones or, you know, we tear an ACL or uh, that type of thing. Um, but I think for me, that's how I'll leave it too, is that the martial arts chose me. I, I did not choose the martial arts. And I'm, like I said, just so happy and grateful uh, for the opportunity to experience uh, what martial arts has given me. 
That's great. Wonder wonderfully put, and thank you. So let's come back. We're back in reality now. You you did get to start training and we're we're back to where we are. But if you look back on your past, you know, we all go through stuff, challenges, rough points, whatever you want to call them. Think about one of them that maybe ties to your martial arts training or things that you experienced in martial arts. And tell us how you overcame it. Uh, the the challenge that that comes to my mind uh, immediately is just last year. Uh, my father died February first, two thousand fifteen. Um, a few days after that, I got a call from my mother, and uh, my other dad was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, shortly after that, um, we had three people who were at one point or currently a part of our school, our studio here in Galesburg. Uh, two young men that were killed in car accidents. We lost another student um, through complications of a stroke. Um, my dad's dog had to be put to sleep. <laughs> that may not sound like a uh, you know a tragedy or an emotional challenge, but uh, it just seemed like last year, every single day, something was happening that was just you know emotionally. Uh, uppercutting me, you know, it, it felt like Mike Tyson in his prime was beating me up emotionally, and I was so lost, and I was so frustrated, and I was just ready to quit and just stop. And I remember the exact moment um, I, I turned to my wife and I said, "I'm done. I don't want to teach anymore. I don't want to do martial arts anymore. I don't want anything to do with this." And I think that it it was just part of the mourning process where you just, you know, you don't want to do anything. You know, you just, you're, you're angry one day, you're sad the next, you're, you know, you feel better and then you feel, you know, not better. Um, but I was really angry for some reason at martial arts. And I don't know why, because martial arts is not a person. It's just a thing. But, um, you know, my dad helped me, uh, with my dream. He helped me start the school and, uh, he wrote, a, you know, a, a check for $600. Uh, you know, he, he, he had kind of gotten tired of hearing me, you know, say things like, oh, I don't know what I want to do next. Or, you know, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I do when I grow up. You know, I was in my 30s and he was like, you know, just shut up and go do it already. And he literally wrote a check, $600. I'll never forget it. Slid it across the table and said, either go do it or shut up. But I'm tired of listening to you. And I was like, oh. So, for me to to keep that school going and growing it and and keeping it on uh, track meant a lot to me because I wanted it to be successful because he had taken a chance on me. He had believed in me. And my mom and and uh, my other father were very supportive and and helped. You know, I didn't have a lot of money, and they didn't have a lot of money, but they they kind of just planted the seed for the dream. And lo and behold, one of my uh, other instructors, uh, a, a friend, a colleague, uh, reached out to me after my father's death and they uh, said something that I, I really wasn't receptive to and he said you need to get back and you need to get training and i said i don't want to train right now and he said i know you don't he said but you need to get back and train and he said you will work through this if you will work it out if you if you will work out that was his words i'm sorry if you will work out this will work out and i thought about that for a little while and i kind of was like eh you know whatever. And slowly and surely, you know, I started to, uh, you know, head back to the studio when it was quiet or I would stay late after classes. And, and a lot of times I would just stand there and cry, you know, in front of a bag and just punch it and kick it and, and just be angry and frustrated and just punch and kick and just, you know, um, and then it just literally feel, felt like it all started to lift. Um, my, my students, uh, the parents at the school, my family, everybody just kind of rallied around me. And I realized that the martial arts, um, this was something that I was supposed to do and that I, I needed to continue. That I, I don't want to say I owed any of my students anything or that I owed my father anything to keep the school going. But I just, I guess I had an epiphany that it was my turn to raise up the next generation of leadership, to pour everything that I had and everything that I knew uh, skill-wise or other into these people and let it go because 
I think I came to the realization that it, that it became all about me. And that really shocked me when I made that admission to myself. I was like, you know, this school has become all about me and it should have never have been that way. It should have been about the people in it. And I had to step back. I uh, started to rely on other people, uh, give other people chances to teach classes, you know, to fail and make mistakes. Um, but if I hadn't had martial arts, um, man, it, it is a scary thought about where I might have turned to try to get through that, that last year. It was just a, a brutal year emotionally. Um, wow. I, it just talking about it right now is, is got me to that, that point where, um, I don't know, Jeremy, I really don't know what I would have done without having the school and other martial arts friends and just the martial arts. It sounds pretty overwhelming and I appreciate you being so open with us as you were kind of going through rattling off that list. I mean, that, that's quite a list of things to experience in such a short period of time. Oh yeah. And I got uh, audited by the IRS. That was the other thing. I forgot about that. <laughs> not, not just one year, but two years. So that was, that was another fantastic, uh, wonderful thing to go through as well. And it, and it was fine. But you know, when you get a letter from the IRS that says, Hey, we would like to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we just, we just piled on more and, and not that, not that you you win, not that anybody out there could say, well, you know, I've been through this. Nobody wins in those comparisons, you know, but I think we've all been through challenging times where things kind of stack up and it, it, you know, might not be as dramatic as what you're talking about. There might be people out there listening that have dealt with, you know, even more. I mean, it, we don't know, but it, at the same time, it doesn't matter. Where I'd like to close out this question, though, is what advice would you offer if someone is on the front side of that, being that you've gone through it, how would you suggest they might tackle or, or, or maybe to say it in a different way, if you, knowing what you know now, had to go through it again, maybe what would you do different? Uh, the, the first answer I would say is I would hopefully, if things, if I, if I had to go back in the time machine, what I would do is I would definitely um, embrace humility. And as guys, we get told, you know, when you're young, don't cry, don't be a sissy, you know, suck it up. And, um, and I cried a lot. Um, you know, every day it felt like just, you know, just overwhelmed with emotion because so many things were happening continually. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate, you know, I, I'd had all my parents, you know, I, I grew up, I, I didn't, I hadn't lost a parent, I, you know, I haven't lost any siblings, um, you know, grandparents, obviously, but it, it was such a profound per personal impact. But I got to tell you, I I had a little bit of an ego, or I think maybe my ego had had gotten built up a little bit, or I had built it up myself. And I somehow had become more important than the people who were in the building. You know, I felt like, well, if I'm not here, this thing closes. And then when I thought about it, I thought, well, if I'm not here and this thing closes, then I've done something wrong, you know? This is about an inheritance. This is about a heritage. This is about giving someone something that can last and them continuing to give back as well. So humility is the first thing I would say. Don't be afraid to cry. Don't be afraid to reach out to your mentors, your instructors, and even your students and let them know you're authentic. You're a human being and you, you do experience uh, tragedies and challenges. And sometimes you do fail. And sometimes you make mistakes, but let them know that you're human. Remind them that you're human because for many years with many of my instructors, I put them on pedestals. You know, you train with someone like Benny or Kitas even for a day and then they just become like, a, you know, again, like a superhero, but he's just a man. And I think that's where I've learned the greatest lesson is, you know, my ego uh, should have stayed outside the door. Uh, and if I had kept it outside the door, I think I would have been able to process process things better. I think I would have been able to get through that a lot better. But my ego really did prohibit me from being authentic and honest, uh, not just with my students and, and the parents and my other martial arts colleagues, but even my family. You know, I'm a martial artist. I'm a tough guy. You know what I mean? We break stuff. Right. We fight. We yeah. spar. I don't cry. And I was a mess. But uh, that, was a, that was a very difficult lesson to learn through the loss and tragedy and challenges that humility 
always makes it so much easier to get help and support because people want to help people who are being genuine and authentic and, and, and humble. And I just kind of want to hone in on that one word, authentic. Mm. And I think one of the one of the places, and I'm going to step briefly outside of martial arts, one of the things that I also do uh, a lot less than I used to is teach marketing and teach social media to people. And if I can boil off the successful versus the unsuccessful marketing that I've seen, that I've worked with, it all comes back to authenticity. Mm. People can smell a fake. Mm -hmm. And if you've been training in the martial arts for a little while, you can smell a fake within the martial arts. You know, it doesn't mean being a, a fake is not, let me say it a different way. Just because you're not a great martial artist doesn't mean that, say, teaching means you're a fake. But to misrepresent who you are or to, to try and be something else, it's just not worth it. Mm. And in this day and age, it's very difficult to maintain that facade. And I think we see it a lot more now. You know, back in the 70s, 60s, oh, you know, I mean, you, you sit and you have conversations with people like Bill Wallace. You know, you have conversations with people like Ron White or, um, you know, people that were around when, when martial arts was really formulating and just growing still in its infancy back in those days. You know, people built reputations for being, you know, good fighters and, and uh, you know, good competitors because the results told the truth. You know, you, you, you really don't want to sit and question, you know, was Joe Lewis a good fighter? You know, was Bill Wallace a good fighter? Uh, the results speak for themselves. They, they both had uh, great success, but they did it. You know, they, they put themselves on the line. They went out and they competed. Now we have the ability where everyone can be an instant celebrity. Hey, I'll create a YouTube video and I'll tell everybody that I'm a ninth degree black belt in um, I hate Rue. Uh, I'll just make that up. Um, <laughs> it sounds like it sounds good, you know. Um, and, you know, hey, send me $100 and I'll certify you. And you too can be uh, a black belt and, you know, all those things. And I don't want to get into the, you know, whether people should be distance training or anything like that. But you know what I'm saying? It's so easy for people to present something now on a much more, as you said, marketable uh, level and not be authentic. You know, there are people out there that are teaching uh, no one. Do you know what I mean? They have no students except other than the people that watch their videos or buy their DVDs or, but they don't have schools, you know, they don't, uh, uh you know, even interact with people. Um, and, and, you know, for some people that's fine. You know, uh, some people just make and enjoy, um, having a great living teaching seminars and things like that. You ask Bill Wallace, why do you continue to teach seminars? Because I love it. I, that's it. You know, he, he loves what he does. Um, but he's authentic. You cannot train with Bill Wallace and go, I don't know if this guy's really as good as they said he was. I, I, I will absolutely challenge anyone out there to find a 70 year old who kicks better than Bill Wallace. Right. Yeah. And as we were talking before we started, you know, I, I was with him and, and some of his black belts this past weekend and had an absolute blast. But I would go even farther and say at 70, Bill Wallace is a better kicker and a better martial artist than 99% of people will ever be at any point in their life. Absolutely. So you can only imagine, and, and obviously, you know, there are plenty of people out there who have seen video. I mean, there's video out there of, of him, you know, at his prime mm -hmm. in the 70s. You can watch, you can see how great he was and still how great he is. I mean, there's no, there's no need to fake that. You can't fake that. Exactly. I mean, that's, exactly. that's really what we're talking about, Jeremy, right? Is, you know, you can call yourself the greatest kicker in the world. You can't. I mean, anybody has the right to say, you know, I'm the fastest guy on the planet. I'm the greatest kicker in the world. It's another thing to put your money where your mouth is and then say, here's the, I'll prove it by being authentic. I'm going to show everybody how good I really am. And I don't know, you know, it's a badge of honor. Most of us, if we've been to seminars with, with Bill, um, you know, if you get kicked in the head by Bill, it's kind of like, yeah, it's a club. You know, there should be a patch. I got kicked in the head by Bill Wallace. And, you know, if you, you know, <laughs> it, it should be a club. Like we should get laminated cards, you know, because yeah. it, I mean, that's, that's what makes Bill so great is, you know, Hey Bill, what's your favorite thing to do? Kick people in the head. 
And, uh, you know, he's got such a great story and he's had such a storied career anyway with the movies with Chuck Norris and, and you know, Jackie Chan and, you know, his work with celebrities and um, all that. But, you know, he's authentic. He is who he is. And he can do what he says he can do. And I think that we as martial artists really could learn because, you know, I don't want to say it because it sounds, uh, you know, like I'm acknowledging that, that guys like uh, Bill won't be around forever, but they won't be around forever. So if we can learn anything from those people, it is be the best version of you you can be and let everyone else make the acclaims for you. But we have far too many people in the martial arts world right now piling acclaims on themselves with no results, if that, if that makes sense. Makes all kinds of sense. And rather than us side go down this road because I know where we're going to end up if we go down this yeah, road. We'll beat the dead horse and, and, and I don't really want to well, do that either. Not, not, not so much that, but uh, you know, just from, from the conversation you and I have had so far, I can tell that we're on the same page and, and uh, one or both of us is going to get fired up on, on this and uh, you know, try to be, well, I know how you try to are, try so, to be no. good. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I don't want you. I don't want you going into you know, to feel the burn mode. You know, I want you shaking, your right. and screaming at me. So, Abs no, absolutely not. I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll I'll leave the political references out of the show. That's not really where we go it's here. It's just a joke, folks. It was pre-show banter. So <laughs> we had a good time chatting. Thank beforehand. you for that. Yeah, we 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 have tractors in common. There are tractors that drive up and down both of our roads. So, um. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if we think back, I mean, you moved to the Mecca. I mean, you've trained with some incredible people and maybe it's something in the water there. Maybe, maybe we should, we should look at piping that water over to Flint, Michigan. Maybe we can, you know, not only help those people drink better water, but create a community of martial artists at the same time, you know, some kind of great mass superhero origin story. But if you were to think of all of the people that you've trained with, mm. who do you think you would identify as the most influential on your martial arts career? The most influential on my career. I would say if you would have asked me in my twenties, it would have been uh, Benny or Um, just, I just can't say enough good things about him, him as a martial artist, as a person, his energy, his abilities. I mean, goodness gracious, um, his uh, willingness to stay humble and continue to learn and, and, uh, uh, just, you know, just an amazing experience and in person, uh, later on, um, I, I guess, mm, man, 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 man. I guess I, I'm going to take a cop out answer, and a lot of people would probably say this, but but I'm going to say Chuck Norris, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, just simply reading his book, uh, the first book I will call it because I know he put two out, um, but the uh, Secret to Inner Strength was his first uh, book where he basically told his story, and I must have read that thing a hundred times. And when I read that Chuck Norris failed his black belt test the first time, it it truly did change my life. I can't even begin to tell you how much that story uh, just changed everything for me. And I think that his authenticity and and him being honest with, in that book um, really helped me and shaped me in a lot of ways. Because I, you know, all you see from people like that, you know, who have been very successful is you just see the success. But when he opened up his life and said, yeah, I've had all kinds of failures, <laughs> you know, I've made all kinds of mistakes and here they all are. It was like, <gasps> Chuck, I can't believe that, you know, you failed your black belt test. How is that possible? So I would say Chuck Norris, uh, first and foremost, uh, someone that I haven't trained with, but was so instru uh, instrumental in my martial arts upbringing because of him simply sharing his story. It, it just really had a profound impact on me. Hmm. And there's a tie there, certainly back to something you were saying earlier that these high level martial artists, they're just people. Mm. They all have their ups and their downs. And, you know, there's something in there about persevering through. I mean, we just spent several minutes talking about with Bill Wallace, mm -hmm. who most people, if we voted, would identify as the greatest kicker of all time, or at least the greatest kickboxer. 
I mean, his record basically says that, 23-0. and 0. Mm-hmm. And he only had one leg to kick with. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't you don't get there with with magic. It's not just a, a lucky roll of the dice. It's hard work. And if you talk to him, you you know that. And, you know, we're not going to turn this into a Bill Wallace episode, but there's something I think that comes from extensive martial arts training around perseverance mm-hmm. uh, for our Taekwondo practitioners out there. It's one of the tenets. Well, it goes. Of it goes so. Yeah. Well, it goes so far beyond the art that you study. And any of us can look around and see people that we've trained with. And maybe it's you, you know, maybe it's, it's you that you can look in the mirror and go, man, I've been through a lot, you know, but I persevered. And we all know as martial artists that you don't accomplish anything in martial arts without perseverance. So if your goal is just, you know, to get to black belt and I was obsessed with it, you know, it was like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. So I thought about it and I, I, I meditated on it and I, you know, just poured over the idea of being a black belt. And the day that it happened, it was almost like, oh my God, I'm here. Now what do I do? Um, But you know, we, we all started training for specific reasons. We all stayed with the training because we are special and people don't like to acknowledge that martial artists are a different breed. You know, we absolutely embrace race challenge because that's why, you know, we continue to chat, we, we continue to train because there's always new challenges. And, um, when you think about, you know, even your own personal life or you look at other people, I mean, I've trained with, I, I've got a student right now, spina bifida has no use of his legs. Uh, one arm, uh, I would say, you know, has a small ability to use, uh, his left arm has a small, I mean, maybe 20% you know, usage of, of his hand and his arm basically has one arm and he will roll out in a wheelchair and he will work joint locks with us and he will punch the bag and everything else. And if you're having a bad day or you're feeling sorry for yourself, it's pretty tough to look over and, and see Michael there. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's one of those things where you don't find that on a soccer field. And that's not to say that kids that, that, you know, maybe have, um, a physical challenge couldn't do soccer. That's what I'm saying, but you don't see kids in wheelchairs playing soccer with other kids who are not in wheelchairs. Right. And martial arts is so unique in that area. I agree. I agree. And then there's nothing, nothing to add. So we'll move on. All this has been great stuff. And I am, I'm looking forward to some of these other things that we're going to get into. So let's talk about competition. You ever spent any time in the ring? I uh, have spent some time doing some competition and I was uh, not, uh, you know, I, all, all I ever wanted to do was spar. You know, I was one of those guys. I uh, didn't want to do forms. You know, I, I did my forms because I knew that was, you know, my next belt. So I was like, oh, I got to learn this form. <laughs> um, didn't really care about breaking. Just wanted to spar, 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 spar. And my um, competitive nature uh, just was always bruised because it seemed like I always ended up with like second place. It didn't matter where I went. You know, I, I would travel, you know, around Illinois and Iowa and, and uh, even in Indiana, you know, competing. And, and it was like, oh man, second place again. I just always seemed like I was just a, you know, a, a half a second behind the other guy or man, they didn't see that point. They should have called it. And, um, it, that's what I enjoyed. I enjoyed that aspect. I enjoyed sparring competitions and, uh, you know, won some trophies, no national titles, no state titles, nothing to get super excited about. But the, the thing that it really did is it, it allowed me to meet some just wonderful people. So for me as a tournament promoter now, um, that's really what it is about for me is just trying to get people to come out and network. And yeah, I want people to compete and you can win a trophy or a belt or whatever. Um, but I, I guess for me, um, I never really wanted, uh, you know, to try to be like, um, George St. Pierre, you know, I had, I really didn't have any, um, desire to like, try to be something like that. I enjoyed sparring and I enjoyed working out with people. Uh, but I definitely never really saw that as a path that I want to take. Like, you know, big fans of Benny Urquidez and Bill Wallace, you know, all those kickboxers, Don Wilson, and so many of those great kickboxers from the seventies and eighties, but, you know, trained, uh, in that style and, and had some, you know, matches, but it just wasn't something that I felt like I wanted to do, um, 
long term because it's a commitment that most people just don't understand. You know, if you're going to be a fighter, uh, and I'm talking about like in the ring, if you're going to be a kickboxer, uh, there are a lot of guys um, who would just show up, you know, and, and you know, they, they, yeah. they worked, you know, they worked as a plumber, you know, Monday through Friday and they trained in a, in a school somewhere and then, Hey, Saturday, you've got to fight. Okay. You know, and they're putting out their Marlboro red and, uh, you know, in the parking lot before they go in and, and take a fight. Uh, and then you see people, you know, like Benny and, uh, Don Wilson and, and Bill and, you know, people like that who took it seriously and, uh, who trained, you know, and they trained, uh, hard and they trained long and they, they trained to have a longevity in their career. And I honestly, I think I was just too young and, uh, there were a lot of pretty girls, um, and there were a lot of concerts and, uh, things like that, that, that kept me not focused on, uh, trying to be the next world champion. There's a path in the martial arts for all of us. And yeah, what you're talking about, the difference is lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those big names, the names that we know, they didn't get there again through a lucky roll of the dice. They got there from a lot of hard work from making it their life. And for most of them, it's still their life. So we heard about your, your respect, your, your admiration for Chuck Norris. So this might be the answer to this next question, but, but I don't know. If you had the opportunity to train with any martial artist that you haven't, be they alive or dead, who would it be and why? Easy question for me. Fumio Dumora. And some people might go, wait a minute, you just were, yeah, you just said, oh, you're talking about Chuck Norris. I just watched The Real Miyagi on Netflix this week, and I have not been as motivated and inspired uh, in, in a very long time with a martial arts movie or a documentary. And watching this documentary on Dumora Sensei absolutely just hit me to the core. I don't know if it's just where I'm at in my life. You know, I'm in my 40s now and I'm starting to look at things a little differently. You know, got kids and, you know, I've got students and I've got, you know, black belts under me. But I'm going to tell you right now, I can't even imagine what that guy could teach me. I mean, he has been everywhere and done everything, you know, from stunt coordinator to doing stunts uh, to really honestly, probably the guy that introduced the, the Nunchaka to the United States. You know, I mean, he really was a pioneer. Um, and I watched that documentary, Jeremy, and and I just, I, I just wanted to crawl through the screen and give him a hug. You know, and I just wanted to yes. sit and listen more than anything. I don't have any questions. I would not have any questions for him. I would just love to sit in his presence. I would love to sit and watch him teach a class because I bet it would be a lesson uh, that would last me a lifetime. But if you ask me today, if there's anyone I could train with, uh, living or dead, I would love to spend a couple of hours with Fumio Demora. I think that would just be an unbelievable experience. Mm. And as you were going through some of, you know, some of who he is, I absolutely agree. But what's funny is I don't think I'd ever considered that answer before. I don't think we've had that as an answer before. I'm sorry to not go with the flow. I'm sure a lot of people no. say, oh, Bruce Lee or, you know, this guy or this guy. But, man, I'm telling you, after I watched that documentary, I I knew of him. You know, I was aware of his work and his influence. And then watching the story of the man, I went, wow, that is a guy that I would love to spend two hours with. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, our answers on this show are, are – I don't know if it's quite 50-50, but it's somewhere close between people like Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, who have had a lot of cultural influence, and people like Shimabuku or Funakoshi, who have had traditional lineage influence. And I would put Demora more on that side. But of course, he's had a lot of influence. I mean, he, he you know, all the the videos that he put out, I mean... I would say he's kind of the, the father of, of modern Kabuto in the United States. Absolutely. And that's what I, I took from that documentary. Now, I'm not arguing for or against, but I think that we have evidence proving that he was doing things far ahead of most other people, or at least he was able to get recognized for doing it. Um, but, you know, the other thing that, that really struck me is, you know, I forgot how entertaining his demos are and were. You know, he, he really did. He was trying to show people, hey, you know, you can have fun doing this. 
you know, because so, you know, it was, oh, killers training this and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then they show some of the demos that they did and that he's done in the past. And, uh, and then you start to realize why he is so popular, you know, to bring to martial arts events and to bring uh, to, to tournaments and, and things like that, because no one does a demo like Demur Sensei. And, and I don't think anyone ever will. I think many people have tried, but his demos are just unbelievable. Uh, his power, his speed, his precision, and the entertainment factor. I mean, it, it, when you watch him do a demo, even on some of these old reels that they included, you want to do martial arts. And, you know, I'm a martial artist, and I wanted to get up and start doing martial arts after watching what he did. So I think that's a, just a huge testament about his influence. And maybe it's, it's gone uh, widely unrecognized um, or acknowledged, but uh, I think that he is just as important to uh, American martial arts as, you know, Robert Trias. I mean, I, I hope people don't, aren't offended by that. If they are, too bad. <laughs> but I think uh, Demora <laughs> Sensei is just as important as Robert Trias. I think he's just as important as Chuck Norris, uh, as Bill Wallace. You know, all these people who are widely considered pioneers at Ed Parker. He is just as important, if not more important, because you look at what he was up against, a Japanese man coming to the United States, you know, after World War II and, and, and you know, hey, <laughs> I teach martial arts. Uh, I don't speak the language. <laughs> you know what I mean? And what he was able to overcome and what he was able to accomplish is just mind-boggling. You know, that's a martial artist, mind over matter, what they believe they can achieve. That's right. Now, of course, we'll link to that documentary from, you know, that the real Miyagi will link to that sure. over at the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for those of you that might be new this episode. And uh, I'll be sure to find a, a demonstration or two from Fumio Demora to link over on the show notes as well. So those of you that haven't seen him before can see how incredible he really is. Now, our next question is about movies. And I'm going to guess, just from everything we've talked about, that you really love martial arts movies. Would I be wrong? My wife would tell you that um, <laughs> our, our, our <laughs> Netflix account, like if you, if you logged into our Netflix account and you saw like Aaron's list, you would see nothing but action movies. I mean, it's... It's just the way it is. I love action. And I love comedies, but I love action movies. My favorite martial arts movie may be another surprise. Um, I think the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the very first live action movie that they did, is my favorite. Wow. Okay. I know. Why? Uh, well, that's uh, uh, why. Uh, two things. One, as being a fan of the comic book and just the idea, you know, that turtles mutate and they learn, you know, ninjutsu, um, you know, what kid doesn't, you know, with an imagination doesn't think that's cool, you know, because then you start looking around your house going, I wonder if the dog can, <laughs> you know, do a jump spinning crescent kick, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's kind of what happens. But I had such a tremendous amount of respect for the martial artists who were involved in that movie and the stunts. Because if you look at what they had to do, the guys wearing the turtle costumes, oh my gosh. I mean, it's one thing to put together a fight scene that's believable, you know, in a, in a normal movie. But to wear these suits and to have to do the things that they did, the action in that movie and the, uh, the choreography in the very first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle live action one is amazing what those guys were able to pull off. It's a really entertaining film action wise, you know, the martial arts stuff that they did and were able to pull off is just amazing. And I, I know that's probably not a popular answer. You're like, well, it's turtles, you know, guys dress up as turtles. Yeah. But there were real guys in those suits. It was not CGI. And I think sometimes people forget that these guys had to learn how to do these things with all of that stuff on. And they have huge respect for me. And, you know, again, who doesn't love ninja you know, turtles who do, do ninjutsu? That's, that's kind of a tough one. You know, I love Bruce Lee and I love Enter the Dragon. Uh, uh, Jeff Speakman's Perfect Weapon, another movie I really, really love and enjoyed. But, man, you just can't beat four turtles that eat pizza and do ninjutsu. <laughs> I completely agree. And, you know, that, that's a move, one of my favorite movies as well. A lot, of, a lot of strong influence, a lot of validation for me as a child. You know, I'm a little bit younger than you. 
but growing up through the 80s, early 90s, and having these cultural references to validate the thing that I was spending all of my time on, I'm always going to hold the Ninja Turtles in a very high regard. But yeah, um, learning how to do martial arts with what must have been tens of pounds of foam rubber. Because uh, if, if I, I can't remember even correctly, imagine. that's what those suits were. Yeah, yeah, I cannot even Incredible. imagine. So the next question, and 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 I'm going to exclude the turtles from your answer. <laughs> uh, but do you have a favorite martial arts actor? Uh, yeah, I do. And again, it might surprise people. Shokasugi is my favorite martial arts actor of all time. I love uh, so many of the guys that have been in that action genre. You know, I appreciate. Um, you know, all of the, the actors, uh, who have done movies from, you know, very, very low budgets to big budgets. But Shokasugi was a guy that, um, you know, back when, when I was a teenager, you know, it seemed like every other week there was like, you know, enter the ninja, the ninja re-enters again, the ninja goes away, comes back and opens the door. You know I mean? It was just like, there was a ninja movie coming out like every week and it seemed like Shokasugi was in every one of those. Um, but I just loved I just love Shokasugi. I don't, I don't know what it was about him per se, um, but I just really enjoyed all of the movies that he made. And then when he came back um, for Ninja Assassin, I was so excited because I hadn't seen him in anything in so long. And he was brilliant in that. You know, he just played that guy where you're like, oh man, you know, this is not a good guy. Um, and, and you can, you can make fun of, you know, the enter the ninja and the return of the ninja movies and the you know, other campy and, you know, Canon films. And, but if you go back and you look and see what he had to work with and what he was working with and the amount of time they gave him to work, um, brilliant. The, the, he was just brilliant. And, and, um, I, I was really excited because we had, uh, we, we finally had another Asian actor who was given lead roles and it wasn't that he had to, you know, speak perfect English. And it wasn't that he had to be a specific stylist. He just seemed to be able to do so many different things, but hats off to him. I'm still a huge fan of Shokasugi. And if you haven't, uh, and if you're a martial artist, that's like a, you know, completely insane statement to say, you don't know who that is, or you haven't seen any of his movies, go back and watch them really today. And even though they might be campy and you might see some things that are kind of silly, uh, he deserves a huge amount of credit because he was a huge star in the martial arts world, in, the, in that genre, and propelled really a lot of the ideas uh, forward for people like Jean-Claude and Steven Seagal and, you know, all those guys that kind of came after. But he, he, I just, I love show. I think he's a, a fantastic uh, martial artist. I think he's a, um, a fun guy to watch. So I would watch anything by him at any time. And I have to admit, I'm not familiar with his work. I don't think I've ever heard his name. So I have some homework to do. Good. I, I'm glad dig, that I dig was, up some yeah. stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, definitely gonna do some homework, watch some films. I mean, oh god, I, I have to watch martial arts movies. What a what a terrible thing. But again, links to some of the stuff that I find over on the show notes. So that closes up our digital media section of the questions. Let's get a little more analog. Mm -hmm. How about books? Uh, Joey Himes. Reader? Bam. I mean, you said books, martial arts books. Joey yeah. Himes, uh, Zen and the Martial Arts. Yeah. Short read. Um, I could read that book every week. It's that good. And uh, if you haven't read it, you need to read it. And if you uh, don't know who I'm talking about, I'm not going to give it away. Um, just read it. It is short and sweet, and you'll be a better person and uh, a better martial artist if you read that book. Uh, and it has nothing to do with technique. But it is a great Great book. And I've, I don't know how many copies of that I've loaned out and, and not gotten back <laughs> over the years. Um, little short book, but it is probably my favorite martial arts book um, that, that I've owned or read other than Chuck Norris's Secret to My Success, the first book that uh, he told his story. Zen and the Martial Arts by Joey Himes. Great book. It is a great book. And listeners to the show know that we've been getting a lot of recommendations for that. So if you haven't read it, go read it. It was my first martial arts book, so it holds a special place in my heart. But as we move on, as we start wrapping up here, what is it that's keeping you going? You know, a lot of us have goals. A lot of, a lot of us, you know, there's something in our training driving us forward. You're, you're teaching, you're promoting. 
but what is it that gets you out of bed and gets you to train every day? A Labrador retriever. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, that's, that's partially true. Um, having, having mentors, having people that have experienced more things in life that have faced things that I have not faced and survived it and, and been able to, you know, climb the mountain. Um, it, it's so important to have mentors because it, it, that alone helps you stay motivated and helps you stay inspired. Because I think that when you have good, positive mentors around you or people that you work with or you're networked with, you know, they keep you on your toes. You know, I mean, if you don't look good enough to wear the belt that you say that you wear, um, and one of your mentors pulls you aside and says, you know, hey, that, uh, that form looks like garbage. You know, what happened? I haven't been running my forms. You know what I mean? Um, and as an instructor, what happens a lot to us is we teach, 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 and then we don't practice as much as we used to when we were students. So I like to train with anybody and everybody when I can. So I do uh, seminars. Uh, I'm going to be heading out in April to go to Evansville, Indiana and train with Dan Inosanto. Looking forward to that. That's a bucket list training thing for me. Uh, I'll go up to Joliet and uh, train with some of my uh, my friends and, and colleagues uh, with the International Combat Aikido Federation. Um, it just, you know, I'll look for opportunities to keep training. And every time I do a seminar, I learn something new and it, it helps keep me motivated. But for me, it's just being a goal-oriented goal person. It is taking the black belt mindset, keeping that in everything I do. And that is, this is what I want to accomplish. And now what do I need to do to accomplish it? And I, every day, wake up with a notebook and I write down everything I want to accomplish. And some people might say, gosh, that sounds like it would take a lot of time. It is, sometimes it does. But right now I have about 17 goals that I write down every morning. And uh, it's just a great reminder. I, I write them down. I look at it and I go, okay, Aaron, we got some work to do today. Because it's kind of haunting and taunting when you spend time writing down your goals and looking at them. And you know, a year's gone by and you haven't accomplished a single one of them. Uh, you know, you need to make some changes. Um, so for me, it's just keeping the mindset of a black belt, always learning, always setting new goals, knowing that the learning never ends, knowing that I can always be better, um, keeping mentors in my life. Um, some of my instructors have retired or stopped, um, but I, I just keep plugging in to other people. And sometimes they're outside of my style or system, uh, but I want to learn and I want to be under people who know more than I do or could teach me something or could share something with me, or just help me in any way, shape, or form. So that's what keeps me going, um, that and, and my family. I think I'm so blessed, and I, I probably say it a lot uh, you know, to people. Um, you know, I'm so happy and grateful for everything that I am and everything that I have, because without my family, I wouldn't have any of it. So they, they support me, and they, they always have. Um, good times and bad times, um, through good decisions and bad decisions. Um, they've always had my back and, and they're always pushing me to keep going and keep going and keep going. And the last thing is just simply knowing that I have the ability to interact with students on a daily basis and that I have the ability to help someone have a great day by teaching the best possible class that I can teach, um, by lifting them up and encouraging them and, uh, sitting beside them and working a form or a weapon kata or whatever it is that we're, we're trying to work on. And uh, getting sweaty and, and helping them and saying, hey, you know, I'll, let's work together. Let's do this together. It's always easier. You know, the two two chords are better than one type of thing. Um, but yeah, my students too, family, students. I know I'm kind of rambling a little bit there, but um, it, it's it's easy to stay motivated when you can accept the love that surrounds you. Wow, there's a there's a motivational poster quote right there if I ever heard one. I'll split it 50-50 with you. All right, all right, half a zero. <laughs> <laughs> so now's your commercial time. You know, what do you have going on? If people want to reach out to you, you mentioned you're a tournament promoter. You know, what, what kind of stuff you got going on? You can tell us. Uh, in December 2015, I published my first children's book. And right now it's uh, it's... It's currently on the top 100 
uh, at Amazon for kindergarten and preschool age groups, and it's called "You Cannot Lick Your Elbow," and uh, it just uh, it's it's not you know going to teach kids um, you know how to do their taxes. It's it's kind of a silly book, um, but it has some factual based stuff in it. Just a it, it's just a a kids book, and uh, with someone like my personality. Uh, who likes to uh, love Dr. Seuss and have loved Dr. Seuss for years. Um, it was really me just kind of going, hey, thanks, Dr. Seuss. You know, here's my <laughs> my very humble offering uh, to kids. But it opened up doors. And uh, it also was a, a great thing for me to do um, because I think it also showed many of my students that you can be more than just someone who kicks and punches, if that makes sense. You know, I, I, I'm more than a martial arts instructor or a school owner or a promoter. I have other creative abilities and I have talents and gifts. And, um, you know, so that's out right now. And I've, I've been doing some signings and things, you know, kind of on a regional level. Uh, my, my latest book is out right now called Daily Affirmations, Growing the Garden of Your Mind. And uh, that kind of takes people... Um, Kind of uh, how I was able to get out of 2015 with all the challenge and the tragedy uh, that I experienced and that my family experienced. Um, I kind of just say, hey, this is what helped me get out of the funk and the depression. And, uh, you know, and that's out. And those are both available at Amazon. Um, and then I've got another book uh, coming out in April. And that's one that uh, my son, my eight-year-old son, who is on the autism spectrum, him and I sat down. I interviewed him and we wrote a book. And he explains to people what it's like to live um, with Asperger's. And that's supposed to be out in April, uh, kind of in conjunction with uh, you know, uh, Autism Awareness Month. And I'm excited for that because um, he's going to get to see himself as a cartoon <laughs> character in the book. So he's super excited. Uh, novel scheduled to be released later this year, and I'm working on a couple of other projects. Um, but, you know, doing some speaking, doing some seminars. Uh, we've got our tournament here in Galesburg in the Midwest coming up April 23rd. Um, have a podcast that I am slowly and surely putting things together. Uh, not completely martial arts related, but just trying to write, uh, trying to promote the things that I have out and um, just stay busy. You know, I'm, I can't sit still. That's that's the one thing that uh, my mom would um, probably want me to make sure that I uh, interjected is, you know, I'm I'm kind of like the Energizer Bunny. It's just, you know, where is he off to next? What is he? What's he going to go? You know, do here and there. I just like to stay active. I just like to to try to create and um, and do things. But if people want to stop by my my website, it's Aaron or excuse me, it's AaronWaynesWorld.com. <laughs> I don't even know what my website is, <laughs> um, and that's my personal website. And you can get in touch with me there. There's a blog that I try to post uh, several times a month, different topics, but it has information about my books. Or if you want to book me for public speaking or a martial arts seminar, you can do that as well. Um, and then I also have a, a website, uh, the U.S. Kuki One um, Association dot com, where we assist people, qualified individuals who are looking at obtaining um, their Kuki One. Uh, Don or Poom ranks. Um, so if you want to hook me up uh, with a little shout out there, we can uh, talk to people and help them through that process. Or maybe you're a school owner who's maybe a first or second and you're trying to figure out how to get your students uh, tested so that they can get their um, their Dan rank through the Kuki Wan. Um, we're there to help. And uh, we've helped hundreds, if that, if not thousands. So that's kind of where I stay busy. AaronWaynesWorld.com and the US Kukiwan Association.com are the two things that really kind of keep me focused and busy. Great. And of course, we'll link to both of those over on the website. And once that podcast is out, by all means, please make sure you let me know. And we'll go back. I'll update the show notes. Yeah, we'll have to have you on. Make sure. Oh, hey. Hey, it'd be it'd be fun to be on the other side of the microphone. Absolutely. Well, I'd love to talk about your products, you know, and, and your line because I'm I'm fascinated by that and your story. So we'll have to definitely, you know, make that a make that happen. I would love to have you on. I can consider it consider it done. Happy to. But now it's time for us to to at least start saying goodbye. You know, this has been a lot of fun, but can't go on forever. But we want to end on the highest of notes. Do you have any parting advice for the people that are listening? Yes, I talk a lot. I love to talk. I was in radio, you know. I'm a, I'm one of those kind of you know bounce around and and animated guys talks with his hands and things like that. If you're a martial artist, and I don't care what age you are, 
and you're listening to this podcast, listen very carefully to what I'm going to say because it's probably probably going to seem a little silly, someone who enjoys talking so much, telling you to listen. Listen more than you speak. If you're in the martial arts, you will waste amazing knowledge and opportunities by talking. Listening can create an amazing, wide open, um, a gold mine, if you will, of things, but you have to be willing to listen. And I think one of the things that held me back for so many years as a young martial artist is, you know, hey, I'm a black belt. I already know how to do that. You know what I mean? I, I know how to do that. I know how to do that. I know how to do that. And I never really worked on becoming a good listener until I came across some instructors that told me to shut up. And I'm not trying to be funny. It's just exactly what they said. Shut up. Listen, do what we're asking you to do. And then if you have questions, but don't question while I'm trying to teach you. And it wasn't that I was trying to be respectful. I'm just a curious cat. You know what I mean? I want to know why and how. And it, but I learned how to listen. And when I go to seminars now, I sit in the back and I listen. And I watch, but I listen. And when I listen, there are things that I have been able to take away that have changed me more than the physical techniques that they may have been displaying. And just listen. Just be a better listener and watch what happens in your life. It, it'll get better. Thank you for listening to episode 70 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Mr. Duke. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, the quiz, a couple great videos of Fumio Demura, including one of him using his belt like nunchaku. We've got another one of the video that we talked about on Netflix, The Real Miyagi. Found the trailer for that. Check that out. Great stuff. Now, if you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out on a new episode. And if we could trouble you to leave us a review wherever it is you get your podcast, we'd really appreciate it. Remember, if we read yours on the air, just email us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, Go ahead, fill out that form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that on the website too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of, and our username is always Whistlekick. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com. Our great line of t-shirts, including the comfortable ones, the technical ones, and really just the great looking ones. But that's all for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.